Hi, everyone. I would like to welcome you to evening rounds number 16 uh, tonight. Um, uh, it's been a great series so far this spring. I was lucky enough to present last month, and I really had a great time with, with everyone, and uh, it was really wonderful to, to continue to have those conversations with people online following the event and through Twitter, and uh, it's been really great reminds me uh, how engaged and how uh, incredible our audience is and the people who come each week. Everybody has really great ideas. Um, as you know, or uh, if you've been before, or if you're a, new, a newcomer to Evening Rounds, uh, Evening Rounds is a monthly speaker series profiling healthcare communications and dig digital technologies. Each month we bring together health professionals, communicators, and researchers to share ideas and strategies designed to affect change in the healthcare system. Um, we're going to certainly explore uh, that last piece, uh, how we affect change in the healthcare system tonight with uh, Steve Morgan who's joining us. I have a few announcements before we get started and I would like to uh, also give our, our good friend Arthur Yee a chance to come up and talk about uh, Providence and their role in supporting us tonight. Um, we, uh, uh, so the agenda for tonight, we'll take care of a few announcements. I'll get out of here. Uh, the presentation will start and we'll go until seven. Um, I believe uh, Steve has some interactive components for tonight's presentation, which is really great. And we'll leave some time at the end for questions. We really encourage questions and dialogue in the event. That's what really makes it most meaningful. Um, we encourage you to live tweet. So um, tonight we do have the um, Wi-Fi working. It's evening rounds if you look for it in your, in your streams. Um, we encourage you to live tweet. I live tweet. You can connect with us at evening rounds. Um, you can also use the hashtag erounds and the hashtag HCS. MCA. I always mess that one up, but I got it right tonight. And that's the Healthcare Social Media Canada tag, which is used across Canada to talk about healthcare and social media, of course. Um, we are videotaping tonight's session, and we share them online at the Evening Rounds website, uh, which is a really great resource for you to check out. Um, there is a Q&A, like I said, at the end. The important thing about the Q&A is that you'll see there are some microphones in front of you, and at the base of those microphones, there's a little red button. Um, what will happen is if you would like to ask a question, uh, press your red button, your microphone will turn on, ask the question, and then you can uh, hit the red button again to turn it off. And what that does is it allows us to record your question through the audio feed that's going to the video. So, um, and if you don't turn your microphone off, we will tell you, please turn your microphone off. Um, and that pretty much wraps up my spiel for tonight. Uh, I would like to thank our good friends and partners, Providence Healthcare, who have invited, invited us to use this space. Uh, and I'd like to welcome Arthur Yee up to the podium to tell you a little bit about Providence Healthcare. Thanks. All right, thanks, Daniel. Um, I'll keep this really short. Um, welcome, everyone, to uh, Evening Rounds number 16. That's kind of crazy, yeah. Um, Providence uh, has been so thrilled to be a partner and sponsor for this ongoing series. Um, I see a lot of new faces in the crowd today, so welcome to everyone. Um, just wanted to take an opportunity to thank everyone for joining us. Um, I know uh, Dr. Morgan has a awesome session for tonight, so uh, we'll let him take the stage. Thanks. So I'll just take a second to introduce Dr. Steve Morgan. He's a professor in the School of Population and Public Health, and he's the director for the Center of Health Services and Policy Research at the University of British Columbia. He is also a leader in Canada's pharmaceutical policy research collaboration and a member of the Evidence Network of Canadian Health Policy. Dr. Morgan has published over 150 articles, book chapters, and reports, and has received career awards from the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, the Michael Smith Foundation for Health Research, the Commonwealth Fund, McMaster University, and the University of British Columbia. He has also been commissioned to provide policy advice to governments in Canada and abroad, the World Health Organization, and the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. So I welcome Dr. Steve Morgan. Thanks. Thank you. 
So thanks for attending, and, and for those of you following on Twitter, uh, hello, a shout out to all those folks attending virtually. I appreciate the introduction. You'll notice that there was one thing conspicuously absent in that rather long biography that was read out, and that is <clears throat> I have no expertise in communications, social media, uh, you know, many of the things that I think all of you actually bring more skill sets and more experience to the table. And so as uh, advertised, uh, tonight's session, I'm actually going to put you to work. I think that there's uh, great collective wisdom in this room. And as per the title of the talk, Crowdsourcing Change, I'm hoping to tap into some of the ideas and insights and experience that you have to help me in some sense with our mission around what we would describe as fulfilling Medicare's prescription or uh, realizing the original vision of Canadian Medicare, which is a, a Medicare system that would be comprehensive of, of more than just insurance for hospitals and physician services, but also a Medicare program that would extend to include prescription drugs, which will be what I talk about, and maybe one day uh, a more meaningful system for home care, long-term care, and other services. But the focus of the talk today will be on pharmaceuticals. This, I, this slide deck's a brand new slide deck, so I'm going to work my way through it a little bit, and there might be a, occasional glitches in it. I don't know exactly how long it will take, um, but here's the, the, the outline of what I want to do. I'm actually going to give a talk for about 10 minutes about why you should care about Pharmacare, uh, just to give you some background content as to why it is that myself and the research team uh, that I work with are so focused on, on this issue about Canadian Pharmacare policy. After that, I'm going to segue into what I think would be a more traditional evening rounds conversation. I'm going to talk a little bit at that point about what we've done through digital media to try to in invoke or, or stimulate a conversation about prescription drug coverage in Canada. And that relates to this, uh, I guess, mo movement, maybe you could call it even, but certainly the initiative referred to as Pharmacare 2020. And I'll talk uh, about that. And then at the end of that presentation, I guess we've got two little mini presentations there. I'm going to ask you to, to help me uh, think about the next stages. In, in essence, I want you guys to tell me uh, what I should be doing next on this file. So hopefully we have enough time for all that. And I'll begin with the, the why care about Pharmacare. Um, I've been working on Pharmacare policy for 20 years now, and uh, I fell into this by accident. I didn't uh, plan to be studying pharmaceuticals, but it it very quickly became obvious to me that it's one of the most important components of the healthcare system, and I want to convince you of that as well. One of the reasons it's critically important is that most of us use prescription medicines at some point in any given year. Uh, three out of four Canadians uh, fill at least one prescription a year. Nine out of ten senior citizens do. So in essence, filling a prescription is one of the most common forms of formal medical care, formal health care that you and I will use. And it's arguably even more uh, commonly used than, say, visiting the doctors to get the prescriptions in the first place, because in between each physician visit, 80% of which tend to end with a prescription, you've, you will fill those prescriptions and take those medicines often on a daily basis. Pharmaceutical policy is important because not only are drugs commonly used, but they can actually do great things. Uh, drugs can and do uh, save lives and save money when prescribed and used appropriately. Um, prescription medicines can be a great way of keeping people out of hospitals um, and, and, and keeping them in better health. Pharmaceutical policy and pharmacare policy, that is the policy concerning who is covered uh, for the prescription, the cost of the prescriptions they fill, is important in part because one in 10 Canadians cannot afford to fill the prescriptions that doctors write for them. Uh, this is a, quite a high number, and I'll come back to this in a minute, but it's uh, problematic if there are potential benefits from medicines that Canadians aren't realizing. This is not just costing us in terms of reduced health and well-being of those individual patients. It actually comes back to haunt us in the sense that those patients, if those prescriptions were appropriately prescribed, may end up back in the hospitals, costing the healthcare system more money than would have been the case if we had just paid for the prescription in the first place. But I don't want to uh, gloss over what is part of Canada's prescription drug problem, and that is that there is 
simultaneously overuse, underuse, and misuse or abuse of prescription drugs in our system. And so this is another reason why pharmacare policy is important, at least to me and I think to many people who work in the field, because we know that by better integrating prescription drug policy with the Medicare system as we know it, we can create better incentives for doctors, policymakers, and even patients to think very carefully about the appropriate use of, of medicines in the healthcare system. And a study done not far from here, actually, at Vancouver Hospital had found out just a few years ago that one in five admissions to the hospital were a function of misused medicines, either overused or underused drugs, prescription drugs in our system. So it's critically important to get this right, to get prescribing and utilization right along the way. And I'm an economist by training, so I can't forget a couple of the, the economic motivations for pharmacare and for studying the, the field. And one of them is that millions of Canadians live in families that pay thousands of dollars every year for the prescriptions that they fill. This isn't thousands of dollars paid by their private insurance companies or by their government drug plans. This is thousands of dollars paid out of pocket by those, those households. And that's a significant burden, burden on many families, and it's something that we would want to make sure uh, wasn't an undue burden on anyone with chronic or serious illness. And lastly, and if you follow me on Twitter, you'll know I tweet about this one uh, quite a bit. Uh, one of the big reasons to think about pharmacare policy is that Canada actually pays more than virtually every other country in the world uh, uh, for prescription medicines. We use them more, we select more expensive ones when they, we fill prescriptions, and we pay among the highest prices in the world for the prescriptions we fill. And as a consequence, we quite literally are wasting billions, that's billions with a B, of dollars every year. And this is money that I think a variety of actors in the healthcare system would like to see better used, whether it's better uh, spent on paying for more nurses or doctors, or even for home, term, home care and long-term care as discussed as potential ways to improve the healthcare system. And lastly, another reason to think about pharmacare policy and actually to mobilize change in this country is that every developed country with a universal system for healthcare provides universal coverage for prescription drugs, except Canada. You know, now, Medicare, in many ways, is a source of national pride for Canadians, but in fact, this Medicare system that we, t that we have such pride in is, is conspicuously incomplete. Uh, there is no analogous, no comparable healthcare system in the world that does not include universal coverage of prescription medicines. Even the United States, even the USA, who we like to, to ridicule in terms of healthcare policy, following the the complete Im implementation of the Affordable Care Act, or Obamacare as it's known, they will actually have more universal coverage for prescription drugs than we do. So we will literally be the only developed country in the world uh, without such coverage. Just want to throw a few statistics out there to prove that universal coverage for medicines can achieve better uh, outcomes than Canada achieves. This Three slides that I'm going to show you show a few statistics with Canada, Germany, the Netherlands, New Zealand, and the United Kingdom. This first slide is the percentage of the population reporting that they do not fill the prescriptions written for them because of the costs borne by the patients. And this is the one in 10 Canadians reporting that they actually decide to skip prescriptions or skip doses because of the cost out of pocket. That's basically double the rate that you'll find in most comparable countries and if you looked at countries like the Netherlands or the United Kingdom, where patients pay virtually nothing for the prescriptions written by their doctors, uh, our rate of what we would call cost-related non-adherence is five times as high in Canada. That's millions, millions of additional Canadians choosing not to fill prescriptions because of costs that wouldn't be uh, the case if we had a system like those other countries. This is the percentage of the population that, that uh, pays over $1,000 a year out of their own pockets for the prescriptions that they fill. Again, Canada virtually off the charts by comparison to other countries, more than double the rate. Uh, greater than one in 20 Canadians uh, bear a cost of $1,000 or more for the prescriptions that they fill. And as I said, we've estimated that it's approximately 2 million households 
that, rep that, that this represents in terms of the total population Canada-wide. And then lastly, this slide may not look very stunning. This is the average spending per capita on medicines in these different countries. As you can see, Canada spends more than the other countries that we're comparing to. But when you multiply these figures by the 35 million Canadians that live in this country, the difference between Canada and Germany is $4 billion a year, every year, forever, in essence. The difference between us and the United Kingdom, the country who probably has a healthcare system that would be most comparable to ours amongst these countries, the difference between our level of spending and the UK's level of spending on medicines for Canada would amount to $14 billion every year. $14 billion every year is enough to double the number of family practitioners in this country or increase the total nursing workforce in all of Canadian hospitals and long-term care facilities by 50%. It's a lot of money, and it is money that we would want to wonder, or at least openly ask the question, could we better spend it if we could actually save that money in the pharmaceutical sector? And again, while achieving better outcomes, like the United Kingdom does, on access to medicines and financial burden of prescription drug spending. And then this last chart is the same data in terms of spending, but on trends, and just to show you that we have certainly now a higher level of spending than these comparable countries, and it has been far less controlled than the comparable countries over the last decade or more. So the policy question is, well, if a universal system of public uh, or, or of prescription drug coverage can achieve better access, better financial protection for the population at lower cost than we spend right now, well, why aren't we doing it? And this, in some sense, is a policy puzzle that's existed since the dawn of Medicare because the Royal Commission on Health Services in the 1960s said we should have universal public pharmacare and we should do it at, at a time when the rate of spending on medicines had slowed down so as that the governments of the day could, could adequately budget, adequately predict what would it cost to implement a system. And we entered this expansion of our Medicare system in stages, starting with hospitals, and then we insured medical services. And we said the next essential services would be prescription drugs, perhaps in the 1970s, maybe in the 1980s it should be implemented. But we never did it, ironically, because it was thought of in the 1960s as being something we should put off until we could better afford or better understand the financial implications of it. And as I've just described, the lack of that movement, the, lack, the decision not to move forward has actually cost us now billions of dollars per year. But there are good political reasons why we haven't moved forward, and those reasons relate to the kind of reason that I'm here today now, and that is that for governments to make a change that is as big as implementing a universal pharmacare program, that is as big as the changes were when governments introduced universal hospital insurance in Canada, and when they introduced universal insurance for medical services. These changes require an enormous amount of political capital. They require that the public, in essence, tell the government that this is what they want and that they will stand behind a government, they will stand behind a political party that is willing to make a change of that nature. And for a variety of reasons, not the least of which is those of us who have reasonable uh, employment uh, ha those of us with reasonable employment have reasonable access to private insurance through our, uh, our work-related extended health plans. For reasons such as that, there's a huge segment of the population, politically influential segment of the population, who really don't care that much about this file or don't know enough to realize that the system that they have, that system of private insurance through their employment, is profoundly inefficient and arguably not serving their healthcare system well. So we sought out, in essence, through this Pharmacare 2020 initiative to sort of provoke, engage people in a conversation uh, about pharmaceutical coverage in Canada, about the important role that insurance plays, and actually the important role of universal public pharmacare in the context of a Canadian-style healthcare system. 
Pharmacare 2020 was uh, a play on words. It was a deliberate title for us, and it, and it invoked two messages that I think were important. Um, one was this idea of 2020 vision, clarity. We need to uh, uh, have a conversation that establishes a sense of clear understanding, not just of the policy problem, not just that people aren't filling prescriptions, they're bearing significant costs out of pocket, and we're spending more than we should, but also clarity about where we want to go. Clarity about what would it mean for pharmacare reform to occur in this country. And we're working on that. Uh, again, the, we, we describe this as a conversation, a uh, bit of a movement, but it is, in, you know, it's a project that's meant to invoke a conversation uh, to get us to that place where there was clarity and, and, and a shared vision. And the second part of this title uh, was on purpose, and that is that 2020 is a reasonable timeline. We know that a policy reform as big as universal pharmacare in this country isn't going to happen overnight. In 1997, the, the National Forum on Health recommended universal public pharmacare, in essence, to happen overnight. In 1998, there were big uh, national meetings to discuss how such a program might, might occur. And by, well, by 1998, <laughs> the program was dead in the water. Uh, because it was too much, too fast. There wasn't really a plan to think about, well, over the next several years, how do we get there? But we think 2020 is a reasonable time frame for implementing a change as big as what we are suggesting, and it's a reasonable time frame to engage people in a conversation necessary, as I said, to, to garner the, the political capital, to build up the, the, the momentum that's needed for, for governments at a provincial or federal level to back a major change like this. So we, had, uh, we wanted to start this conversation. We had a couple of constraints. One of them is, is budget. Uh, we are funding activities around Pharmacare 2020 as part of a knowledge translation allocation of a budget for a research team that I, that I ran for the past five years. And we can't spend a huge amount of money. We actually have no full-time staff dedicated to this initiative at all. It's the kind of thing that everybody is asked to do off the corner of their desk. We've garnered together a little bit of money to help create websites, uh, uh, most of which, to be honest, comes out of accounts that are in my name that are deferred consulting income that went to the university for me doing consulting work for government. And we use that money, that deferred income, uh, to fund things like websites and Twitter uh, feeds and infographics, et cetera. The other thing that we have a, a constraint on is that we're academics. And well, if, you, if you type in professor, in Microsoft Office, this is what you get. Um, and in some sense, there's this dilemma of when does an academic move from being a student of a policy issue to being an advocate? And, and there's a major tension there. And in, in the world of social media, where, the world which I know many of you in the, that virtual space, uh, we know each other's avatars at least, um, there's a lot of ac academics that are out there being advocates for change. And I, I think that's admirable, but it's dangerous. It's risky uh, for university professors to be in a space like that. It's certainly risky for professors that don't have tenure. Uh, this entire initiative took place after <laughs> I achieved tenure at UBC, which may, may have been uh, on, uh, uh, a happy coincidence or certainly uh, gave me more freedom to, to do what I, I'm now doing in this space. But in the world of health services and policy research, which, which I work in, and, and, the, and, a, and it's a center, I, I, or that's the spirit of the center that I'm the, now the director of, um, we do feel a very strong sense that as academics in a university, particularly those of us with ten, tenure, we actually have an obligation uh, that we should be engaged in these kinds of conversations. So we are encouraging our faculty members, we're encouraging uh, members of our network of research across the country to actually engage the public in the conversation. If we just publish papers, if we just stay in the academic realm, uh, our work will quite literally sit in a shelf, as very good work from members of our field have, has done, dating all the way back to the Royal Commission in the 1960s. There's been numerous studies. As I said earlier today, or earlier tonight, I've been studying this file for 20 years. I worked on the National Forum on Health as a research assistant preparing their recommendations for Pharmacare in 1997. Lots of academic work has gone into proving that this would be a good thing for the country. 
but it hasn't translated into political capital. It hasn't translated into that momentum that you need for success. So that's, um, for us, it's now, and certainly for me at this stage of my career, it's put aside the, the, the narrow view of academia and think of the broader uh, public purpose view and recognize that we're gonna bear a few uh, scars at the end of the day. Uh, there, there are uh, uh, you know, the occasional disparaging remarks and there is the uh, potential risk of, of uh, slower than average progress through the ranks, but I think we'll get there. Um, so with that in mind, the first thing that we did, and I, I've, I've cited a lot of work, my closest colleague at UBC is Michael Law. Uh, Mike and I, for the last oh, five years now, have almost exclusively focused our efforts on uh, pharmaceutical policy research in the public interest and trying to get really good quality scholarship published in good journals. That, that you know, This is not us making up stories, this is us doing good science on the business case for pharmacare reform in this country. And so we've published, I can't, I, I think it's 24 papers Mike and I published together in the last uh, five years. Almost all of them focused on this issue about what is the appropriate system for pricing, reimbursing, and promoting uh, the appropriate use of medicines in this country. And that was an important starting place for this movement for, for Pharmacare 2020, because I think we needed our science in place so that we could take that science and then use the platform to engage a conversation to say, you know, this isn't just ideas or opinions. Uh, this is informed opinion. This is, this is uh, science-based advice about policy. So the, the, the first thing we did in terms of the Pharmacare 2020 movement, after getting together a body of knowledge that we felt was ready for translation in a, in a broad way, we did what academics always do, we hosted a conference. Um, but we did a conference in a, for us, which was a big risk. We invited the full political spectrum. We had the Canadian Taxpayers Federation on one side, and we had the uh, Medicare uh, Coalition on the other side, and everything in between. Uh, pharmaceutical industry, insurance industry, medical profession, nurses, pharmacists, you name it, and representatives of the public, representatives of patient interest groups. And this was the beginning of the conversation. This, this event took place just a year ago here in Vancouver, actually just across the street, as it were, um, at, the, at the Sheraton Wall Center. And we, we started the dialogue through a very big, very public uh, um, conference. And, and for that public conference, we, uh, we worked with Signals, actually, to develop the website. And, and we also uh, wanted and, and decided to invest some of our money into production of videos to promote the human face of Pharmacare 2020. That is, not the academic face, but the, the patients, the people affected by that. And I'm just gonna play one of the videos that, that we produced at that time, if my machine will cooperate with me. Um, this is just a 90 second clip to give you an idea of the kind of thing that we, we spent a little bit of money on. And I, I think, in hindsight, that it was money well spent. This computer, on the other hand, maybe not so much. There we go. When I tr contacted them to try and purchase private insurance, they told me that they wouldn't uh, cover my diabetes because it was a pre-existing condition. It was a difficult time, and I was fortunate that I was able to get some outside, outside help to pay for it. Otherwise, it would have been too much. It would have been hundreds of dollars a month, adding up to thousands of dollars a year. I was really frustrated because it seemed like it was unfair that here I was having to pay out of pocket, you know, thousands of dollars just to live. Like, if I didn't have this stuff, I would die. And it just seemed like this was an unfair burden. It wasn't something I'd ever asked for. I didn't do anything to become ill. And I felt just pretty abandoned a little bit. And, yeah, it was, it was unfair. So these videos for us were, um, I think, quite a success. We, we were glad we did it in the academic realm. Not a success in the broader public. None of the videos that we produced in, in advance of our meeting I think the, the top viewed videos were you know, on the order of 500 views on YouTube, which anyone knows is, that's a miss in, in most circles. Um, but it did give us a level of excitement in the academic and policy community that the event that we were hosting was meaningful, that it was about real issues, real people, not just about numbers anymore, not just about Mike Law and Steve Morgan putting out yet another paper talking about some statistic. It gave a, a, a human face to things. 
Um, again, not big numbers in terms of broad public, but within the communities that we were trying to attract to that meeting, it was successful. I would redo these things very differently again in the future. We worked with Patient Voices Network in British Columbia to, to get some of the patients on board for these videos, which was fantastic. It was really helpful and actually a real learning experience, learning about them and about the services they provide. I think I would work with them again, and I, and I think we would produce slightly different videos. But for, the, for this purpose, and particularly for attracting people to our conference, those videos were some, somewhat successful. The other thing we did to promote the conference, but it's turned into being more important for just continuing the dialogue, uh, was to create a Twitter feed uh, that was for Pharmacare 2020. Uh, we did have this vision that Pharmacare 2020 wouldn't just be a single event, but would you know, foster dialogue ongoing. We only have 700 followers. So this is not general public viewers, but I think the followers that we have, notwithstanding the fact that there's a number of bots and stuff that will be following us, but the real people who are following Pharmacare 2020, maybe some of you, maybe many of you, are people who do work in the field and, and probably are, are a voice that is helpful to us in the sense that what we are trying to do is get a conversation started. And so in essence, we're looking for many people to carry on those conversations. And those, let's say, 500 real human beings that are following that account are probably effective spokespersons for change in the system. We did create a Facebook page, uh, and Chris is sitting in the back who's responsible for occasionally uh, updating this. It's just not particularly successful. Um, 78 people are following it, probably 12 of them are my family members, so, uh, you know, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not so sure. We haven't figured out how do you use Facebook for this kind of dialogue, and I'd be looking forward to hearing your advice on, on effective tools or maybe examples of groups that have done Facebook much better than we have. We've been really fortunate to partner with Healthy Debate. Uh, it's a, a blog, ultimately, or a, 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 a network that, that, that hosts blogs about the Canadian healthcare system. It's physician run out of Toronto, so it has a very good active uh, health professional audience and voice. And they were kind enough in the run up to the Pharmacare 2020 conference, and since that, they were kind enough to, in essence, let me be a resident blogger. And we use that space to, to create dialogue. And I think that was fabulous. In fact, using someone else's platform, rather than build the blog into our own website, was, uh, was done out of necessity, because we didn't have the, the time, energy, or money to, to run our own blog that would be active enough to have an audience. But glomming on, as, you, as it were, to another blog, uh, I think was a very effective tool. And I, I'm in tremendous, tremendously indebted to the, to the Healthy Debate folks for, for having us uh, join them. Um, I've got the Flickr icon here, although this is a bit of a lie. We don't have these cartoons on Flickr, but we actually commissioned a number of these editorial cartoons. I think we have 14 of them if, in total. We were ab about enough to make a calendar. So maybe, uh, maybe in 2015 we'll get the Pharmacare 2020 calendar going. Um, we did these because they're so remarkably cheap. Uh, uh, per dollar spent, you know, we spent I think 1,200 bucks on these things, or you know, remarkably little money uh, by comparison to producing even a single video. And uh, the, the rate of consumption on Twitter and, and social networks is is fantastic. The rate at which these gets pa get passed on or show up in other people's presentations as just the funny mo moment of, of, of brevity or uh, you know or of levity, sorry, in a, in a presentation is, for us, it's, it's useful. It's, it's quasi-viral, at least within the academic and policy uh, and analyst communities. Um, and I would do them again. Uh, my, my wife works for a, a, an engineering uh, consulting firm, and they've hired the same uh, cartoonist to do stuff for some of their projects because they found that even their clients love these things. They're, they're funny, uh, they get a point across, and they're relatively cheap. Um, we created an infographic, we had an idea of an infographic that would be part of a website that, that we built, and uh, uh, we've kind of buried this a little bit. We placed it in the wrong place. It's actually in a PDF on our current website, but the infographic itself has been quite effective, as infographics are. Whenever we tweet them, they get retweeted numerous times. In fact, just as a pilot for the fun of it today, I just sent this out for the 11th or 12th time on my feed, and sure enough, 
within minutes, it's got a dozen or, or more retweets. Uh, and, the, and for for my feed, which is not a very, uh, not, I'm not a celebrity on Twitter, uh, you know, a dozen retweets uh, within a few hours is, is a pretty good, pretty good uh, return. And then the other thing we did with, with signals, um, and I, you know, I know they did a great job and they worked uh, to, well, probably too many hours on this project, but labor of love, right, Robin? <laughs> Um, we, when this conference was over, we rebranded our Pharmacare 2020 website as basically a big infographic. Uh, it's hard to explain, but it's a, it's a, it's a vertical website. You, you've got to scroll all the way down, but you get, you get through different pieces of, to of the topic. And on the, as you scroll down, you get factoids, little sound bites, little bits of information that can be useful in a conversation about this, this policy change. And this has turned out, we, we, we're terrible, low budget, no staff to, to monitor this. We don't do a lot of active you know, monitoring of well, what, what's the Google Analytics look like. But I do know as I meet with people across the country at conferences or I attended some technical briefings or I gave some technical briefings to all of the political parties in Ontario a couple of weeks ago alongside with a number of nonprofit organizations. And it turned out that the nonprofits were using this website to create their own materials to talk about pharmacare. Well, heck, that's exactly what we wanted to do, is to create a platform for a conversation. So I think this site, um, the pharmacare2020.ca site, its redesign has served a purpose. We copied, in some sense, ideas um, um, from other websites. So it's not new that you would do this. But I think it was reasonably well done. And I think I would do it again. I would, you know, I would hopefully have a bigger budget <laughs> the next time, time around. But I, I think that this was the kind of thing that there was an appropriate use of the resources we had, and a, and a good way for us as an academic group to spark a conversation without being too preachy, without sounding too much like an, like advocates in the process of doing that. And then the other thing we did after our conference is we videotaped experts that were attending the conference and asked them to just basically come to a, a green room kind of thing and, and, and do some uh, expert videos, which are all embedded throughout that new website that we've created. And I'll show you one of those just to, to give you an idea of, we make mistakes. Um, and I love these videos, but only, only I could love them. Drugs are a way more important part of people's health regimes than they were half a century ago or at the dawn of Medicare. And that almost uniquely among OECD countries, uh, we don't cover a very high proportion of prescription drugs. So we're laggards in that respect from a public policy sense. And it has a lot of consequences, both financial and in terms of health, uh, that we shouldn't be all that proud of. If you're going to be uh, spending some of your time and energy on trying to improve the healthcare system, this is the next frontier. The next frontier is to make sure that pharmacare is fully integrated into the rest of Medicare. So if you're a Trekkie, you might like that one. Pharmacare is the next frontier. Um, those videos that we shot, we, we, we thought this would be a powerful tool, having kind of talking you know, heads, <clears throat> telling insightful stories as experts in the file. And again, Amongst our nerdy academic community, these things resonated. In my office, the team was really excited, like, oh my god, Stephen Lewis, he's so great. This is little Stephen Lewis, uh, an absolutely brilliant health policy consultant, but he spells his name differently than big Stephen Lewis, uh, uh, who, who is expert, as many of you know, in a variety of things, and former UN envoy. But we, we like these videos, but the truth is, is that the hit rates are terrible uh, because they just don't resonate. They don't play on the narratives that you need to play on in order to get people to pass a message along. And so all of you with your communications expertise and your experience in marketing or promotions will know that, yeah, an academic would like that video, but that's about it. Um, I would redo those, but I would do them absolutely differently. And uh, I'm glad to know that other units have done that. and and and. Um, it's not just us engaged in this conversation. Uh, many of you may uh, know from her recent uh, rise to uh, YouTube's uh, sensation status, Danielle Martin, the former president of Canadian Doctors for Medicare, 
uh, the Canadian Doctors for Medicare actually produced a number of these uh, similar videos. Uh, same story, talking heads, except in that case it was all doctors talking about uh, cases where their patients weren't able to fill prescriptions or some of the dilemmas that they, they saw in their practice as a result of our lack of, of drug coverage. Uh, you can Google Danielle Martin Pharmacare and you'll find uh, her talking about this issue. And I was shameless about promoting that the week that her uh, YouTube uh, video of her Senate testimony in the United States came, came online. I was right on there uh, on and off throughout the day saying, well, if you like Danielle Martin on Senate, you should see her on Pharmacare. Uh, the Evidence Network uh, group that I'm involved with, but they have actively participated in the Pharmacare conversation, have tried... Uh, you know, these quote uh, images. So Marc-Andre Gagnon, who's a, a colleague and, and uh, a researcher in the, in the same space as we are, um, he's got a few of these clever little infographics or quote uh, graphics from the Evidence Network. They don't have video yet, um, but we do know that there's a coalition of seniors groups uh, that ha is producing videos. The Canadian Federation of Nurses Unions and a couple of other unions are actually producing videos uh, about Pharmacare. In fact, I heard uh, in, in a meeting a couple of weeks ago that one of the, one of the, one of the major unions in Canada is going to be coming out with videos in a not too distant future advocating for Pharmacare. So I was delighted, started patting myself on the back. Oh, it must have been all my hard work. Uh, but the best part was is that they did say that they had gone to Pharmacare 2020 as a website uh, to source out some information as they were scripting their videos. I think, and I haven't seen them yet, we will all sometime soon see them, I think that those more professionally done videos are going to do a lot more for engaging people in, in meaningful debate and conversation than our um, pointy-headed academic ones. So <clears throat> that's my story. I'd be happy to take a few minutes of questions before I, I ask you to do some work, because I've got a challenge uh, for you guys. I want you to help me do some work. But before we do that, I'm happy to maybe ask, answer a few questions, and then we get to do some homework. Robin. Can you take a question from Twitter? Sure can. This is not my question. Somebody, I was tweeting about what you were saying. Somebody said, doesn't Quebec offer pharmacare coverage uh, unlike the other provinces? Yeah, so Quebec's interesting in that it has a system of universal coverage for medicines through compulsory participation in the private market. So Quebec achieves universal coverage by mandating that every, anybody, or specifically any employer, who offers any form of health-related benefits to its employees is required by law to also offer them Pharmacare coverage, or at least private drug coverage through a private insurance company. If you don't work for somebody who offers those benefits, by law you are required to purchase them from the government and at premiums that are in the neighborhood of about $900 per year. So Quebec actually has universal coverage, but it's not universal public coverage. It's universal more or less private coverage with relatively high risk groups, low income people, precarious working populations, retirees, the disabled. Those groups are in the public plan, and then everybody else, by law, has to have private coverage. So the system does achieve universality. It has a few problems with it in terms of it's very expensive. It's by far, if we think Canada's is one of the most expensive systems in the world, Quebec's is by a long shot the most expensive system in Canada. Um, so it's by way of having multiple payers involved and having private insurance companies involved, that's a very inefficient uh, way to run a system. So it's universal, but not efficient. Well, 
Well, we do. Yeah, so uh, the PharmaCare staff, if you talk all the way up to the ADM in PharmaCare, they will tell you that they believe that the system could be better if it was universal and that, and that they, it, would, it, would be, it would be better for British Columbians, for instance, if they had more budget. But the political courage and that therefore the political capital that's needed is that we have to get behind the idea and, it, and basically the, the sticker or the sticking point is your Minister of Finance. We need to convince governments that actually spending a little bit more in the public purse for the benefit of the entire system is a good idea. Um, and, and right now we're at a point where we haven't convinced British Columbia that they should cut a bigger check for the PharmaCare system in BC. I don't think that's impossible. I think actually, again, over the timeline that we're describing, we, we may be able to move those yardsticks. We may be able to get uh, this government in British Columbia to, to take the next steps. But it does require that people um, support the idea of slightly bigger government. And this is, I talk about difficult narrative in these times, right? Uh, nobody likes big government. I mean, even, you know, even um, people who are <clears throat> on the left side of the political spectrum, the, the former, you know, spend thrifty folks uh, don't w want to go forward with political platforms that say higher taxes, even when higher taxes means better health care. So again, if you talk to staffers, particularly off the record, um, I think they're all supportive. I, even in Ontario, these briefings I did a couple of weeks ago with government of Ontario and the opposition parties, they're all, they're all support the idea of Pharmacare. It was actually stunning to hear just this very blunt statement. They get it. They understand the business case, but what they need is the political support. They need the public to, to kind of understand the same business case and make, and make a, a demand, sorry, of their government to say, yeah, this is in our interest. Yeah. Who, when you talk about like political capital, who do you want to lead it? Like, do you want it at the federal level or does, should it come from the provinces? And if it's the provinces, do you need every single province and territory you sign on. Yeah, and, and so there's, that's a, a great question. And it's actually, for us, like many of the, of the questions around this file, it's a, co a compl complex or complicated uh, story. Healthcare is uniquely in the Canadian context a uh, provincial jurisdiction. And so in essence, you, you would look to a single province to lead. And, and we were in uh, Ontario a couple of weeks ago you know, advocating that the Ontario government and the opposition parties who can expect that they're going to be in an election mode any day now. Like, we were advocating that they put, position Ontario as the leader for Canada and, and become the country, the, the province, sorry, that demonstrates the, the possibility for the entire country, which is exactly how Medicare came about in this country. Saskatchewan, Tommy Douglas, demonstrated for the country that you could win. You could win political support. Uh, you could provide better care. You could control costs by universal coverage of hospitals and eventually medical care. Um, it took a province. That said, um, pharmaceutical policy is a little bit more challenging because it involves national chains of drugstores that have power in all markets. It involves regulatory authority that occurs at the federal level in terms of what gets approved for market in this country. And it involves uh, various secret discounts and deals on pricing for medicines that may make it difficult for one single province to move and leave the others behind, even if it's moving forward in a demonstration case. Um, so that you know, it may be the case that we would be looking for a coalition of provinces. You may not need all 10. In fact, in the current political climate, you won't get all 10. Now, you'll get nine at best, uh, probably four or five uh, in, in, in reality. Or you look for federal leadership. You look for a federal government that says they're going to become the enabler and, and, in essence, move provinces further than provinces will go on their own, uh, even when that movement is in the interest of their own public. But they may need a little bit of a, 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 you know, a push. At the federal level, it's clear that this particular government won't be that government. It will, this is a government that has been very clear that their hands are off health care. Um, and, and so they will not engage in any what would be considered new federal initiatives on health. And this would be a big new initiative. 
Uh, but, you know, at the federal level, in, in anticipation of the, the election in uh, the fall of 2015, uh, we have all of our uh, researchers and networks, you know, working on, on the political parties in, in anticipation that they will have something related to pharmacare in, in, their, uh, in their campaigns. So we'll see about that. Yes, hi. Uh, you're saying that the politicians kind of get it. Uh, in uh, you know most of the provinces, probably even at the federal level, um, the the question I have for you, uh, Stephen, is um, who is responsible of educating the public? Because yeah, if the politicians are educated and kind of understand what's going on, and uh, the fact that we're wasting fourteen point five billion dollars every year, they understand that. Um, the public, I believe, has no clue that this is happening. Uh, the perception in Canada is that we have this amazing uh, healthcare system. They don't really understand how pharma care plays into the whole picture. So, in this era of social media, like the democ democratization of media, where everybody has an opportunity to actually say something about this, it's uh, it's kind of strange not to see the public being outraged about the things that are happening in, in this country. But maybe the reason is that they simply don't know. Not that they don't care, they just don't know. And I, and I think this is a case where um, <clears throat> part of the argument is that they don't know. And, and part of the argument is that there's been a comfort in the status quo because it's been a bit of an invisible problem, particularly, again, for people with reasonable employment, the, the white-collar workers, and even some of the, the, the blue-collar workers of this country if you're in a well-unionized employment environment, you probably have extended health benefits, and so you probably don't see the cost of your prescriptions as a burden, and you don't realize that you're lucky. But if you are the owner of a small business, and you have to pay for those extended health benefits for your employees, or worse, you can't offer them to your employees so that you no longer can attract good workers who happen to have children who have diabetes, and therefore, those workers need to work for government or big corporations in order to get those benefits. It's this invisible problem, you know, where we're not aware that this is actually going on as well as we should. And that's why Pharmacare 2020, that's why in some sense we've moved from studying it in a, in a pure academic sense to saying, we've got to take this information and get it out there. And, and this tension of, well, if government knows, why won't they talk about it? We, I had a great conversation or debate, I suppose, this week about this, uh, just on a conference call yesterday, saying, because I, 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 I think if I can read this file correctly, uh, when I meet, mo often in camera with politicians, and in, not in public spaces, because politicians don't like to take risks, but in camera, they will say, you know what, I get the argument, I, I, I just need you guys to get out there and make the case. You guys have to, they literally tell me, which is good. I, mean, I know I'm doing the right thing when they're saying, yeah, you need to get Canadians talking about this. The reason that they can't do it, the reason that they need a royal commission or a, a, a groundswell of just social media to bring this to the, the, onto the political agenda, is that when I say $14 billion would be great, I think realistically we could probably save $9 billion. There's pretty good numbers to back an estimate of that size. If I say I can save $9 billion through a system of universal coverage that'll give us better access and better financial equity, that's great, but for somebody, that $9 billion was income. And that's the dilemma in healthcare policy in fact, in any policy file, is every dollar of spending is a dollar of somebody's income. And when you start saving money in the system, it means you threaten incomes. For political parties, the incomes that they threaten by making an announcement about pharmacare are to companies and, and, and interests that also fund political campaigns. So going into an election mode, it's difficult, for instance, for a political party to say they're really behind pharmacare to save billions of dollars when what will happen is the chain drugstores of the country, who are probably stand to lose a couple of billion dollars in, in revenues that they manage to collect through a complicated system of, of uh, kickbacks and reimbursement on generic drugs in this country, they, that's a very powerful lobby and very powerful interest it would be in ministers' offices, but also cutting checks for campaigns. 
similarly, the pharmaceutical industry, the generic industry to some degree, and, and the brand name uh, industry as well. Uh, very powerful, influential lobbies, uh, arguably among the most influential in, in the health file. Um, and then the private insurance industry, who has become under increasing attack lately, uh, particularly on health benefits in this country as being uh, criticized for the, the, the perception and, and uh, that they're not delivering value for money and that they're not actually providing a value-added service, particularly for the kinds of administrative and, and profit loads that they put on their, their um, files. That, that's a powerful lobby. So this does require this, this you know, democratization of, of information. We actually need the groundswell, grassroots activism, grass, grassroots conversation to overcome political interests that actually have a very strong hold on what are well-intended political parties, but political parties are machines that need to be fed. And unfortunately, uh, the disinterested masses, the sort of, you know, the fused, the fused interest of, of all of us can't feed that political party unless we actually start banging on their doors and saying, if you want my vote, you gotta do this. Okay, I'm gonna take the risk of actually having you guys do a little homework, even though we're just coming up on the hour, um, if I can. <laughs> I'm looking for, perfect. So what I want you to do is I'm gonna distribute a couple of, of these big sheets and some markers. And I guess what we'll do is I'd like, like it if we could get maybe three or four groups to do the, this exercise. And this is gonna tap into your creative skills, so. Robin, maybe if someone could just, there's post-it note sheets that we can pass out and markers. The, the exercise is this. I want you guys uh, to help us think about who the audience is that you, would, that you could engage through social media, through digital communications. Who, who can be part of this conversation? If Pharmacare 2020 is a movement that's inspired by getting people talking about something that would be in all, all of our collective interests, uh, who is that? And in order to, to give you an opportunity to tap into your creative selves, what we'd like you to do, and I think if we get, again, maybe three or four groups, I want you to draw this, this audience. You know, a cartoon character, whatever you want it to be. Uh, and I want you in your drawing to, to be able to articulate who this is and draw something that alludes to the ideas about what it is that would motivate these people. What, how do, how do they engage? Why do they engage? And um, if you can, think about this ultimate challenge, which is I'd like to see increased hits on our, our various uh, online <coughs> materials, but what we really want to do is move people beyond just clicking like into this idea of actually taking action by sharing ideas by telling stories and eventually demanding change. Um, so in essence, that's this idea about how do we en enable grassroots leadership. So if we could spend 10 minutes, because then we'll have about 10 minutes left to have people share their ideas. Uh, and if you could maybe just collect yourselves around these white, these flip charts. And, and uh, we'll hear back. So 10 minutes to draw this character, who you think is our audience, and how you think we might engage, engage that character. Okay, and if we could wrap up and then do maybe a couple of minutes of reporting back. Oh, I see now group number one or whatever group this is <coughs> did the did the drawing. I'm really excited about. I hope that makes Twitter. Oh, and there's a drawing too. Perfect. So if we if you don't mind, if, if someone can volunteer themselves and perhaps the group that has the stick person. Uh, could could speak and, and if someone would like to either come up or or even share this uh, mic or, or use the podium mic to talk about stick woman or man at the back why don't you put your mic on or, or someone from that group summarize that Great. <laughs> Okay, so we have um, stick guy over there. 
who middle class has his prescriptions paying out money for taxes mortgage car kids uh, and the like and but what's next you know if he loses his job what's going to happen what won't he be able to pay for what's going to give yeah so the idea was just generally people go through their lives thinking everything is good everything is great and all of a sudden something hits them like you could have I don't know, get cancer or something, you can get some sort of disease, rare disease, and all of a sudden, okay, now what? Now that sort of like life you've had of the steady income, the good life has changed, and you need to think about things that ordinarily you would never would have thought about. Like, oh wow, these prescription drugs, which I thought were used to be covered by my employer, now aren't. There's like real costs here I need to worry about. And with with universal healthcare, we not have those those worries, but then the doctor says, okay, this what you need to get better, enhance you this sort of prescription. And before you'd be like, oh, cool, whatever, go get aspirin. You don't worry about the cost. But now you're like, whoa, that's real dollars that could have gone to food, could have gone towards uh, helping pay for the kids' summer camp. And now change yeah, needs to happen. So this sort of like reality hits them like, wow, now what? What's next? It's the upper middle class Canadian narrative. It's your kids' hockey camp or your prescription drugs. Which, are the, which is it going to be? But it's, I, it's an interesting I, uh, vignette or, or per, persona to, to think about. Um, and, and, and maybe after, on Twitter or through other mechanisms, I'd love to hear from anyone who's had experience reaching out to sort of uh, middle class or even upper middle class uh, populations through digital campaigns uh, or otherwise. But I mean, we're here to talk about digital campaigns. You know, who, where do these users where do they hang out, uh, vir virtually speaking, and how do we engage them? Uh, well, I think that'll be a conversation after, but uh, I think that that's an interesting audience and we need to think about how to connect with them. I'm having dinner tomorrow night with some of my old high school buddies and I'm gonna figure out from them, like, so do you guys care about what I do for a living? And <laughs> maybe I'll use them as my sample. So uh, the group here, the 50 plusers, who would like to be the rapporteur for that group? Preferably someone from that group. <laughs> uh, well, we, uh, we were looking at the persona of uh, someone who is 50 plus. Uh, they're heading towards retirement. They um, are looking at what's going to happen after they retire, what kind of changes they're going to have in their insurance plans. Are they going to have insurance plans? Um, are they, is it going to go directly from employer coverage to out of pocket? Um, we had talked about uh, a groups, uh, connecting with advocacy groups for those people, for example, the Canadian Association of Retired Persons, um, as well as sort of grassroots groups uh, who are focused at, at that kind of area. Um, we weren't, well, despite the, uh, the Facebook um, analytics that, uh, that have been saying that uh, a lot of people in that area are, are quite uh, tech savvy, um, we were talking more about how uh, to get the, the stories out there and um, the, the sort of consensus in the little group was that it would mainly be children telling the stories of things that are happening to, the, to their parents in that area. So a lot of emphasis on the caregivers as well. Right. Now, the 50 plus, because you didn't say 65 plusers, but the 50 plusers are Facebook users, are they yes. not? Like, so this Very is, much so. This is not Twitter, but this is, there is a digital space for this, that audience. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay, well, but thanks. We, uh, we also talked about um, uh, making sure that there was some traditional media campaign related to this. Um, and, uh, well, my comment was that hitting the community newspapers would probably be a little bit more effective in hitting these people because they're already starting to be more concerned about what's happening in their little community as opposed. Yeah, and I appreciate this idea of get, connecting with like CARP and other groups of that, like in part because they also do traditional campaigns. And so if this is just basically a conversation and we're looking for other storytellers, other people who can become part of that dialogue, actually it's, it's the goal ultimately would be to actually kind of, you know, be viral in the sense of having other people carry the campaign forward, on, you know, on, in their own words and in, uh, with their own media. So that's a great example. Uh, the last but not least, though, oh, the group without a drawing. 
<laughs> Radicals. That's okay. Who would like to be the rapporteur of this, the reporter on this one? And please use your mic. I think they like to pick up the sound yeah. so you can be famous online. Like I said, we didn't entirely follow the instructions, and we didn't come up with a uh, with a persona. We we had a fairly uh, wide range in conversation around um, how how advocates coalesce and sort of where where the hot spots are, because a lot of the people that we're talking about who are affected uh, by these issues are very diverse and probably not that or organized as groups. However, within the uh, older generation, like the other group said, um, the, the boomers and the zoomers, um, organizations like CARP would be a great place to start um, because um, they are sort of um, aggregating people who um, are tend to be um, educated, informed, um, and um, perhaps have a little bit more time to take that advocacy role. Um, as well as uh, caregivers as, as advocates um, who can speak more about their, their personal experiences um, uh, caring for parents and, and the, the impact um, that, that caregiving has. Um, what else do we say? Um, uh, considering traditional media um, as uh, as uh, something that would be important as well, and really driving home the key messages um, around um, the impact of the wastage of, of money um, and and looking at cost benefits ROI, um, sharing these stories with the general public. Um, And also um, engaging non-healthcare partners um, to advocate. Uh, advocate. One of the, the comments that was made was around, um, you know, the, the reason why there there isn't uh, enough money for education and some of the other things that we talk about um, in in politics is because healthcare takes such a gigantic uh, proportion of um, uh, of taxpayer dollars, and there could actually be some interest interested groups outside of healthcare who might take up the charge as well. Yeah, that's a good point. Can I just ask the captains of industry, to, just to catch that idea again? Uh, I think we're talking about influences, influencers there. Um, the, uh, we're, and I think it, it, it goes uh, again to um, the fact that the people who are really vulnerable with some of these things um, are, it's, it's, it's hard for them to get organized and to speak out, but if we can really capture the, uh, the opinions and, and the advocacy role of, of people who are influencers, who have some, some power and, and, um, and uh, some influence, that that would be useful. Okay, great. Well, um, thank you. You've, this is really helpful. I, the one thing I'll close with is just an invitation um, uh, I'm, I'm slow to respond on email because my, my email box fills uh, every day with an incredible amount of administrative uh, responsibilities at the university, but, uh, but I, I would lo love to continue the dialogue if people have ideas uh, and, and wa want to uh, carry on uh, virtually or in person, I'd be happy to, to carry on. I will continue with this file. Uh, we Our center and our research network across the country will carry on with uh, doing this kind of work. And so we're always happy to, to get advice from people. And if, if you've got uh, suggestions or pointers of campaigns that you think have been successful, maybe campaigns that some of you may have run with the organizations that you work with, um, please uh, share them. I, I'm always happy to steal someone else's bright ideas and, and, and use them for our, <laughs> our initiatives as well. So thank you. and. Uh, that's it for me. Thank you. Well, thanks, everyone. That was fantastic. I think there's been a huge uh, discussion happening here and online. And, and just to follow on Steve's point, you can always continue this conversation online with the hashtag eRounds and the hashtag for HCSMCA. Uh, and we look forward to hearing more from you 
And we thank everyone for, for coming out tonight. Thanks to Steve for a wonderful presentation. Thanks. And, and Robin and Phoenix and Mike. May. What do we, I didn't have, I don't have any, I don't have any information about May, but we will be, May 20th, we'll be doing, you can hit your mic. <laughs> Digital Health Innovations, May 20th. With uh, people from Surrey Innovation yeah. Boulevard and uh, Ryan Darcy and folks. Yeah. Thanks.